Good morning, everybody. Happy Father's Day. I should do this. Good morning, everybody. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> I would like to share a few announcements with you before we begin our service. Um, I just want to let you know that next week there will be one service at 10 o'clock. Then the following week there will be one service at 10 o'clock. A lot of people said, oh, really? So just so that you know, what they're doing um, next week is we will meet at 10, and then we will have the service, which I have no idea what it's going to be. I have a great fear about that. Okay, just as long as I don't have to obey. <laughs> So, so we got we got service, and then we'll have a potluck after that. So, if you have not signed up to bring chocolate dessert, then you can <laughs> go out here in the commons and sign up. Uh, actually, there's sides. They want people to bring sides and desserts. Please make sure that you do that. Uh, the following week, they're inviting people to come at nine o'clock instead of having like a um, reception. What they're going to do is they're going to bring in donuts and fruit and juice and uh, coffee uh, so that you can meet the family at 9 o'clock. So come a little early and then go to the 10 o'clock service. So for the service next week, it's come at 10, potluck after. For the service after that, for the 1st of July, it is come at 9 don't get too much sugar in your body, and then stay at 10. So, so that's what you got coming. Uh, also, if you are someone who picked one of the little cards off the board to um, get a gift card for Intex family, or if you were someone who was going to bring a gift, you were supposed to have those in today, please make sure that you get them or you call Marsha. She's coordinating that. Uh, to make sure that she knows what you got so that she doesn't go duplicate whatever you got. Also, today is the end of the Peninsula Rescue Mission. If you brought something, I know they have packed it up. Just make sure that you mark it for that and put it on the credenza. Also, tomorrow ends the plastic bag collection, so make sure that you get all of those in. Now, those are all the announcements that I have. Are there any more from the body of Christ? Being no more, let us center ourselves and focus on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, as long as the back pew behaves itself. <laughs>
Would you please stand for our call to worship? Come, sing praises to our Father God. For he is our God, a father to the fatherless. The one in whom the lonely find a home. Come, let us worship our Father God together. Our opening hymn is number 144, This Is My Father's World. remain standing as we share together our opening prayer. Oh God, we come today on a day when we celebrate you. You as our father and our earthly fathers, as we come to understand what it means to be loved, to be accepted, to be embraced, and to come to know your grace. Be with us as we celebrate today. Receive our praise. We pray this all in Jesus' name, and all the people say amen. amen. Please remain standing as we affirm our faith together using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mother, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, on the third day, he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and is sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen.
seated. Do you want to come down for the children's sermon? I was actually talking to the kid behind you. Abby. Abby, I wasn't talking to you. Yes? Come on down. How are you? We're going to talk about Papa and Daddy. Come on. You ready? Okay. You ready? Okay. I got, oh, you're going to come out. Be with us. <gasps> Look who showed up. <laughs> All right. Are you ready? You want to sit right here? You get to see my backside. All right, I got a question for you. Do you know what today is? Do you know why you came to hear your papa sing? Yeah. Father's Day. <clears throat> what do you celebrate on Father's Day? Fathers. <laughs> what, what do fathers do? What do fathers do? Do they love you? Do they work hard and get food on the table? Yeah. And, and what about granddaddies? Do they spoil you rotten? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I had a daddy. My daddy's in heaven. He died, but he's, he's still, parts of things that he taught me were really special. He taught me I could do anything I put my mind to, he taught me that, that he would always be there to love me and protect me and would make sure that I was provided for. I had lots of food. And he taught me about somebody that's really special. Do you know who that is? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Yeah, Jesus is pretty special, isn't he? Anyway, Jesus has a daddy too, a heavenly father. And the Heavenly Father loves us so much. He sent Jesus so that we could know all about God's love. Isn't that pretty awesome? It's kind of like granddaddies or pop pops, right? Because they tell you about Jesus, right? Yeah. And daddy tells you about Jesus. And they do that so that you can be safe and that you can be saved. Isn't that cool? Okay. All right. So we're going to pray and thank God for our Heavenly Father. And for our earthly fathers, repeat after me. Dear God, thank you so much for my daddy and my pop-ops and, and, and all the people that bless me and watch over me. And mostly God, thank you that you're my heavenly father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, babe, for your thumbs up. Okay. Bye. Bye. Love you.
Amen. Amen. Uh, our scripture today, there you go, thank you. Our scripture today is one that was chosen for Father's Day. It talks of the understanding of what a father needs to know. So I think I'm going to preach this way. Maybe not. All right, so I want to share the scripture with you because uh, what we don't understand is that fathers come in all shapes and sizes. Can we have an amen? Sometimes they're adoptive. Sometimes they're step. Sometimes they are just those who step in the place of wayward children. And today we begin to see that Abram's vision was one for a biological child, but even before he stepped in that place, he became one who was basically an adoptive uh, father for Lot. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're then going to go in and step into what does it mean to truly be someone who mentors father, mother, grandparent uh, in the faith so that a child will come up in the ways they should go. So let's uh, read this scripture together. It was after this that the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant of my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took Abram outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord credited to him as righteousness. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father, on this day I come as one who no longer has an earthly father because he's gone to be with you. But I also come as one who's been influenced by many earthly fathers and you as my heavenly father. I ask that you would come today and that you would teach me between the difference of believing in and believing, that I might truly understand what it means to be one who is a child of God, who knows what it means to have a heavenly father who loves them, and that you would show me your ways that I might walk in them. I thank you for your grace and your mercy today, and I pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, and all the people say amen. Now, I need to let you know that my son, Robert, was a real challenge. I was expecting an amen, dear. <laughs> it's an understatement. He really struggled to fit in, especially in junior high. Junior high can be rough. Can I have an amen on that one? So he had a bad EI, which is emotional intelligence. He had hypomania, which means that he was going 90 miles an hour 99.9% .9 of the time. He was a nerd. That was his father's son. He was a brainiac. He was someone who loved math. Um, the problem was, even though he was very smart, he couldn't read social cues. And because of that, he would often put his foot in his mouth and get into trouble. <laughs> I think they're saying that he's just like you, dear. I'm so sorry. But to make a long story short, when he was in junior high, because he was this kid who was kind of out there, kind of didn't have it all together, not only would he often put his foot in his mouth, he was also a target. 
And the problem happened when a couple of the boys in middle school decided that he was going to be the target for a glue bottle. They had been picking on him all along and bullying him when all of a sudden one day we get a call from the principal because they thought Robbie's nose was broken. I have never seen a man so hot in my life. And I'm not talking about, hey, baby, hot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had to do everything to bridle him back and to keep him from wanting to kill. It was in those next couple of days that we went, and, of course, just did, did rain. They got um, basically put on restriction. They were... Uh, taken out of school for two weeks, the boys were, and um, things finally settled down. Robbie grew and matured, and we kind of taught him how to bridle his mouth a little bit. But I'll never forget the righteous anger that Mike felt when he wanted to see justice done. You've often heard it say, uh, you can mess with mama, but don't mess with her babies. I think it's twice as hard for daddies when they see something happening to their children. As we begin our text today, we see Abraham. At this time, his name is Abram. He still hasn't made a covenant. He still hasn't been circumcised. But he and God have a relationship that is very tight. And at this point in this relationship, he has gone from Ur. He has done several things that weren't quite right because he didn't know the difference between believing in God and believing God. And so he gets to this point in his relationship with God, and he's coming back to this place, and all of a sudden, something happens to Lot. Now, Lot was kind of the type of kid that Robbie was. He got into everything that he wasn't supposed to get into. And so we see Lot. He's in the place of Sodom and Gomorrah. He's getting involved in all of this stuff. And all of a sudden, because Sodom and Gomorrah were the big, big, town in uh, that whole area that had lots of money, these four kings decide they're going to overtake this area. And when they do, they take Lot and his, all the people that belong to his family and all the booty and all the money. Well, I don't know about you, but Abram was an awful lot like Mike. He said, that ain't going to happen to my family. Have you ever seen your man say, that ain't going to happen to my family? He stood boldly, and he got all of his men that he had trained, and he went out, and he recovered not only Lot, but all the people from that area. And all of a sudden, Melchizedek shows up, and all the spoils are there, and the king of Salem and the king of Sodom says, Oh, wow, you did a great thing. Because you did a great thing, we want to give you all the spoils. But it's interesting that in this state, Abram doesn't want the spoils. What does Abram want? He wants Lot. He wants to make sure his child is okay. And once his child is okay, everything else is okay, right? Right? And so what he says when he tries to give him all the money, he says, no, I don't want that. I've got God. Ah, I've got God. I don't need your spoils. I don't want you to be beholden to you. I don't want to be beholden to any school system. You will make justice happen. This isn't about what makes you look good. And so Abram stands with God, and all of a sudden Lot is set free. But then something happens. You know, something happens after you do things. You begin to think about them. You do things in righteous anger, but then after you do them, you go, well, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. And so all of a sudden we find Abram, and he's kind of struggling, and that's the only way I can figure out why God did what God did at this point in the text. Abram is lying awake in his tent, afraid that something's going to come knocking at his door, otherwise known as four kings who say, oh, well, that was just a punny old shepherd. What did he do? Think he could come out here and kick our you-know-what? And all of a sudden, he's thinking, they might come back and get me. Even though this was what God wanted, and he fears. And so what did he need at that point? He needed that reassurance, not that he believed in God, 
but he believed God. And that's when Father God shows up and he begins to promise him and give him the blessings. And what did he say? He says, I will be your sovereign. I will be your shield and your great reward. And it's at this point that all of a sudden something shifts in Abram's relationship with God as God comes in a vision. Now, the word of God is something that interacts with us. As we read the text, it comes alive, it begins to sparkle, it begins to brighten, it begins to become something new. Now, God speaks in other ways, does he not? What are some of the ways God speaks? How does he speak to you? How many does he speak through a song? Through prayer. Hopefully through your preacher. Through scripture. Still small voice. A vision. And that's what happens to Abram. He is given a vision as the word of God comes to him. And it's in this vision that God shows him, and we don't know how that is. Is it possible that in a dream, a shield comes down and covers him? Is it possible in the dream that blessing is poured out on him? Is it possible in the dream that something spectacular brought him to that place where he knew he was safe? Have you ever had a word speak to you that way? And you all of a sudden had a peace that begins to permeate your whole being. And that's where we find Abram. Now, Abram should have been happy, right? He's got the shield. He's got the faith. He rescued Lot. Everything's going well. He's going to get the reward of the Lord. And yet, Abram is not happy. Have you ever been at that place in your life? In your faith? You got everything. You know you're blessed. All the stuff is good. You won the soccer team. You won the baseball team. Your team won. Everything's going well. You got money in the bank. You didn't lose your retirement fund. Thank you, Jesus. And yet there's still something missing. That's where we find Abram. That's where he begins to be a little what I want to call restless. He had no reason to be restless. The fear had been put away. God said, I'm your reward. And if God is for you, who can be uh, against you? But all of a sudden, something's missing. And all of a sudden, what Abram does is he says, that's good, God, but... Have you ever done holy buts with God? God, it's really nice you did that, but I really wish. I thank you, God, for what you've done, but. And that's where we find Abram. I'm really excited, Lord, that you took care of my son, but I still want to see justice done. Okay. And so that's where we find him, and he goes, God, I really thank you for all of this. You made me a wealthy man. You're giving me everything I need, but. Do you remember that promise you promised me 10 years ago? Oh. Abram was old, but he didn't forget. Right? And so he says, God, I remember what you said. I remember 10 years ago that you were going to give me a son. And so there's kind of a hollowness in this gift you're giving me. Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I still remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus and Abram said you have given me no children you see in that day and age a child was considered a blessing from the Lord so though God had watched over him though God had done what he, what he said he was going to do he still had fallen short of one thing and I'm not sure that God did it in a way that wasn't for Abram's good. Let me explain that to you. As Abram begins to struggle with this promise being empty, yes, God was his shield, 
At the same time Abram was feeling empty, he began to say, I don't understand. What was God doing in the midst of that? Is it possible God was strengthening his faith? You see, because it's one way to believe in God, but it's another way to believe God. Ah, think about that a minute. We can believe in God. There's a lot of people that believe in God. Even the devils believe in God, and they will even tremble. But to believe God is a totally different thing, isn't it? That's where I see Abram at this point in the text. He realizes that God said he was going to do something, but does he really believe God is going to do it? He wanted to believe. We want to believe sometimes, but we don't have enough faith or we don't have a strong faith that God will do what God says he's going to do. And that's when the Lord graciously comes in and he clarifies for Abram, what he said. He says, this man will not be your heir, but a son of your own flesh and blood. Now, this is the point where I step into the text and said, yeah, you said that 10 years ago, God, but I think that's where Abram was. You said you were going to do that, but, and that's why God had to appear in a vision so that he could see with his own eyes. Abram would not end his days with Eliezer as his heir. God would indeed fulfill what needed to be done that would come forth from his body. Although I need to let you know from this point forward in the text, it is 15 years later. Sarai was getting old. She was still getting old 15 years later when God's promise came. However, in verse 5, this is where God's vision comes. He comes in the middle of the night to show him the vast number of stars that his descendants will be. Now, in a place where there are no lights, if you go out to a place where there are no lights, aren't the stars more beautiful? This was in the middle of the desert. Trust me, there was no lights anywhere. I imagine he could see the whole swirl of the Milky Way. And as he's looking at that, he begins to see what God is truly saying. In the years left to wait between the word and the fulfillment of Isaac's birth, Abraham must have looked many years and many days up in the stars. But it was that vision that held him solid. It was that vision that allowed him to know that indeed he would have the descendant, the bright and morning star. And everybody knows who that is, don't they? That's Jesus. As he entered this conversation of promise that was uncertain, he exited with a purpose in mind. God explained to him once again what needed to be explained And he gave him the assurance of the stars in the sky. And because of this, Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord credited it to him as righteousness. Now let me explain that to you. It is in this this text that he is no longer believing in God, he is believing God. What is the difference between believing in God and believing God? A moment of justification. It's no longer, I see what they got, I believe what they got, but I believe. And because I believe, there is now a relationship that is solid in the center, and God can do some stuff, all things. Do you see the difference? And because of his belief, it was credited to him as righteousness. That is a right relationship. Now, we have two types of righteousness. We have things that we can accomplish on our own efforts, believing in God. And then there's a righteousness that comes only from God, believing God. It is only God and Jesus Christ who died on the cross who can bring us into a right relationship with God. That is the only way 
the truth, and the life. And all the people say, amen. And it's because of that, that uncertainty of believing in versus believing God, he went from one extreme to the other. Prior to that, he misunderstood. But after that, he knew. That trusting, that accountedness came because at that point, the perfect righteousness had been afforded him. This is the place in the Old Testament scripture where we see justification by faith and faith alone. It is not by anything Abram did. It was only because he believed God and it was credited as righteousness. As a matter of fact, in Romans 4, 1 through 3, it says, What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? No. For if Abraham was justified by works, he would have had something to boast about. But not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abram believed God. And it was accounted to him as righteous. And then in Romans 4.19 it says, And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was nearly 100 years old. I don't know how he did that. And the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver from the promise that through God's uh, would strengthen his faith and give the glory to God and being fully convinced that what God had promised he was also able to do. This shows that trusting in the Lord is the means of obtaining his promise and his blessing. Not trusting God, but trusting God. Not trusting in God, but trusting God will. It was faith and faith alone that caused Abraham to account, be accounted as righteousness. The faith that made Abram righteous wasn't so much believing, as I said, in God, but believing God. Do you believe God? Do you believe God can? Do you believe God will? Do you believe God enough that you can stand on it and set that example for the next generation? Ah, and that to me is the difference of being a father who fully trusts in God fully knows God and has a personal relationship with him. So while nothing is more fulfilling than having babies and loving babies and being a grandma, I know what that's like. I love it when my babies have babies. Can we have an amen? (laughs) We need to know that as we raise our kids, even though we are set with many challenges, and I would say more so today than there was when I was being brought up. The Christian word and the Holy Spirit need to be our guide. Without the word of God and without the counselor of the spirit, we are lost. And we can only be there if we believe God. If we believe that God can, God will, as we abide in that belief. What better way to raise a kid with the understanding of what the Lord can do than applying God's word and the spirit to our life. The Holy Spirit is an excellent guide and counselor. I don't know about you, but your babies, Evan, they didn't come with owner's manuals, did they? Anybody get an owner's manual with their kid? Are you sure? Ah. You see in here, it talks all about raising them babies. It talks about being righteous men and women not departing from the word of God, but teaching them as you go and as you come, when they rise up and when they lie down. I remember some of the things my daddy used to do. He was a a man of God. He was someone who cared about us. Um, He always provided for us. He worked way too hard. He was a pharmacist and owned pharmacies. And Dave can attest you work way too hard being a pharmacist. He cared about people. I, I, I remember some of the things that Daddy did. He kind of had this, um, this place over in the corner of his pharmacy that sold food. Pharmacies don't sell food. But, you know, there was people in the neighborhood who couldn't afford food. And he also had one of those, um, I don't know if you ever remember this, uh, an account system 
where you'd go and get something and they'd say, well, I'll just put it on your account. More than once, I saw my dad write it on there and then instead of putting the amount, he'd put a zero. And he'd say, you know, uh, those things are going to go bad. Would you go over and get some of that food off the shelf for me and, and take it home with you so we don't have to waste it? My dad did things that made me know that not only was he a gracious man, but he was a loving man. He always made sure we went to church. He always prayed before meals, after meals, whenever we needed anything. And it's because of that, because he was someone who protected us and led us and guided us in God's way, that I found out that all things are possible with God. And I found out that we're called to act on that belief. I want to close with a story about a little boy. This little boy had been talking to his daddy for months because there was a birthday party coming up of his little friend Billy, and he, he really wanted to go to that birthday party. And, and, and he said, Daddy, I'm just so excited about that. He went and he, he saved his own money, and he bought Billy a, a, a beautiful birthday present. And, 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 and the day that the party came, he woke up and he was devastated. He was devastated because a blizzard had come into town. And he says, Daddy, what are we going to do? i got to go to that birthday party. He says, son, son I, re I really don't think it's a, a good idea for you to go out in that blizzard. And he said, he said, but Daddy, I worked so hard to get him a present, and he's my best friend, and Daddy, I just want to go. And he kept asking him and asking him and asking him and begging him. And finally his daddy said, well, I guess you can go. So he got all his clothes on, and he began to trek towards Billy's house, and finally he got to Billy's house. And when he turned to go in the door, there was his daddy turning around, going back home. You see, often we think as parents that we're all alone, but we're not. Because our Heavenly Father is right there with us, guiding us, protecting us, watching over us. He is the one who is always present with us, protecting us from danger. He is the one who will be with us no matter what. As fathers and mothers, there's never a time when we're truly on our own. There's never a time when an injustice happens that God's not in the midst of that and he won't correct it. It is with the devotion that we do, the faithfulness that we give, that we know that our Heavenly Father is even more faithful than we are. And that's why we celebrate Father's Day because we got the greatest papa in the world. Can I have an amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. We thank you that you are always with us, that you will never leave or forsake us. We thank you that no matter what happens in life, that we have you to guide us. And we just ask today that you would be with all the fathers, that you would guide them, that they would have the assurance, not only of their salvation, but of the Holy Spirit. Watch over them today as they lead their children in the ways of God. Be on the right side of that father and the left side of that father. Be with the mothers and the grandparents, that those children will know none other than Jesus Christ. And it's in your name we pray and all the people say, amen. Um, I want to let you know that Greg Gardy is home. Uh, that's not a good thing because they've called in hospice. Um, so please be praying for the Gardy family and especially for Melissa as they're in these end times. Uh, there was nothing they could do in the hospital for them. So please watch over them. I know there's others that you might be praying for. Uh, so we're going to just take a little bit of time and, and lift up those things on our hearts that are so important. Let's go to Jesus. Father God, we just thank you for all that you are and all that you call us to be. Surround us today as we are called to be intercessors of your grace. Father, I lift up Greg, Guardian, and Melissa, and I pray for these next days. 
I also pray for um, different people who are struggling because of the loss of Susan and not quite understanding how that all went so wrong. We pray for their grief. Father, we also come and we just ask that you would hear our prayers as we lift them up to you, that you might comfort us, that you might lead us in what we need to do, and that you might watch over us. Hear this, the prayers of your people. The Holy Family. Holloways. Lord, we pray for those who are healing from operations. We pray for those who are in rehab. We pray for those who need your healing touch. Father, we thank you that you are a God who loves us. And we know that we can find that peace, but only in you and you alone. So bring us ever closer. Help our faith to get stronger that we won't just believe in you, but that we will believe you and we will trust you and we will walk in your grace. And we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And all the people said, Amen. Our closing song is Faith of Our Fathers. You'll find that in the hymnal, number 710, or you can sing it from the screen. <laughs> Go for 
forth in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, knowing that the Father loves you, that he cares for you, that you are a child of God. Go forth in that blessing and all the people say, Amen.